thanks for coming along to my talk today. And it's always good to uh, be in the company of free thinkers at a university as opposed to sometimes being in a company and being process locked. So uh, I appreciate that you can ask me more difficult questions than I'll probably get very often when I'm doing a client visits. Um, I'm Chris Banks. I work in the oil industry in Aberdeen for a company called Slumberger, which is uh, currently the leading oil services provider. And I work in a particular operational segment that produces geological software to help develop oil and gas fields. And my main job is going along and seeing various clients and various asset teams. Those are teams of uh, individuals that run an individual oil field and trying to get them to work as well together as they possibly can. So my talk is on high resolution modeling, but my main focus is really dealing with the human interactions between engineers and geologists and getting to actually speak together in a more effective way. And we can do that through having unified earth models. So I've used the word step change and I realize that that's a little bit passe these days, but I couldn't decide whether a paradigm shift or a step change was necessary. But you cannot go to a conference these days without having either one of them in there, otherwise nobody turns up. So I thought I'd start off by being quite cheery and giving you the, uh, the good news from the oil industry, that if we look at these two graphs, these two graphs show oil production in the UK sector of the continental shelf, and we are well past the peak oil. People debate when peak oil was, but around about 2000, we peaked oil production from the North Sea, and we are now in inexorable decline. So that is, that is the fact. Scarcity drives up, uh, drives up prices, but unfortunately Saudi Arabia are pumping out as much oil as they possibly can, which means that the oil price is relatively low, even though OPEC yesterday decided to cut production and has driven the price up to about $52.50 was when I last checked, and I'm now obsessive with this because it means jobs to me, so I, I checked about five minutes ago. So oil's in pr oil production is in decline. The price is, has been relatively flat and quite low since maybe two years ago. And so we're now in a lower for longer climate and companies are going to have to adapt their cost base in order to meet the, the lack of revenue they're getting in from the oil price. But also for, I guess, young people at universities, the biggest problem we have at the moment is, is talent. And what we did what the oil industry did as a whole to react to, the, to the, uh, the lower oil price is reduce their cost base. And the way that you do that is you get rid of people. And when you get rid of people, you tend to get rid of the most expensive people first, which tend to be the older people, which also have the highest amount of experience. So unfortunately, we're now in a situation where revenue it coming in is lower, the price of our commodity is lower, it's in decline, and we don't necessarily have the same talent base that we had a few years ago. Plus, on top of that, the way that we're developing oil fields is becoming more and more complicated, especially if it comes to sort of the shale gas, shale oil revolution, where we're using more wells to access a smaller and smaller resource. So we've got less stuff in the ground, a lower price, less talent, and more wells. So that's an interesting problem. So we have to ask the question, how do we effectively develop new, and new fields or bypass fields? Those are fields that we didn't care about yesterday because we had so much of the stuff floating around. How do we develop the existing fields that we've got to be optimized? We can develop them quite easily, but we need to optimize that development. And how do we maximize the remaining reserve? And energy security is obviously a big topic at the moment, especially post-Brexit. The geopolitical situation is changing somewhat. And so really, we need to maximize the reserve that we've got left for the energy security of the UK, and we can have high carbon versus low carbon discussions at another point. So we need to develop our oil fields. And it turns out that development is exorbitantly costly. If we're going to develop a new aircraft in the aviation industry, people really appreciate you have to throw money at the problem and you have to really carefully develop the technology in order to get a new product off the ground. So here's a picture of an Airbus A380. That cost about £11 billion to develop. 
the capital expenditure to develop an oil field is not wholly dissimilar. So I'm just showing a, uh, just a graphic and just an illustration. That Statoil Mariner, which is a field that they are drilling now, so we've got metal in the ground, we've got new wells coming on stream, cost about $7 billion to develop. So doing these things physically in the North Sea is very, very expensive. And I work for a software company, so my maxim is get it right physically, make all your mistakes in the software, get it wrong digitally. So I actually go around enabling companies to get it wrong in order for them to get it right when they've got very expensive infrastructure out there in the North Sea. So with the software, I want people to enable them to develop cheaper, faster, and most importantly, safer. So let's keep going with the, uh, with the analogy of, of an aircraft. You wouldn't get in an aircraft that hadn't been thoroughly tested and thoroughly simulated. So to test an aircraft, you build a simulator, you throw chickens at the jet, at the jet engines, you know, you see, you, you test all different scenarios, different turbulence. If you get it wrong, you end up with that situation, which nobody wants. It's exactly the same when we're dealing with high capex projects in the oil industry. We build subsurface simulators, and if we get it wrong, we could end up with that situation, and my mortgage doesn't get paid. Or even worse, we could end up hurting somebody. So we build simulators to test how the oil fields are going to react under a complete, complete suite of different conditions so we can get it wrong in the software in order to get it right when we put the infrastructure on the ground. And there are lots of questions we can ask our simulation. We can ask, will new wells flow? Will it hold CO2? I guess it's quite topical for you guys. What mud weight should I use? Is it going to produce gas, oil, or condensate? How much capex should I put into it? Should I abandon it and go and do something else? You know, should I, uh, how much sand will be produced? There's a whole suite of different questions. And we can divide those questions really into two types. Ones that I've highlighted in red there, that are ones that we need time transient simulations. We need simulations over time to really test. And ones that are in blue, which we can actually develop just by making a model of the subsurface now. So we can actually define two different types of model. The first is the static model. These are models that are fixed in time. What is the situation today? We, these are geocellular models. Imagine digital Lego, Lego bricks. We build them up out of these geocells. These are made by geoscientists, and they're done to reflect complexities of sedimentary fascias, complexities of geological structure, You know, to see the whole subsurface to the extent that we know within some bounds of uncertainty. We're, we're, we're giving the best that we can do to make the best model that we can possibly make with the most amount of cells that we could possibly use. So a typical one in the North Sea these days is a couple of million Lego bricks or geocells. A really complex one is tens of millions of cells. And us geologists like to think that that's a precise picture of the subsurface. Notice I use the word precise and not the word accurate. So geologists say this is an accurate picture of the subsurface, whereas an engineer will say, oh, thanks for that. That's a really high definition screenshot of one snapshot in time. So then we tend to, as geologists, give our models to the engineers and the first thing that they do is discretize them to be a lot coarser. And a typical model these days is about 400 to 600,000 Lego bricks or geocells. They're made by the engineers. They're simplified geologically and in terms of the stratigraphy and the rock properties they can be somewhat simplistic if you ask a geologist. But the important difference is they're time-stepped as in you can run them backwards in time, you can run them forwards in time, and they'll tell you how that field should react under a suite of conditions. So it handles production rates, injection rates, uh, thermal changes, geomechanical changes, changes in chemistry, multi-phase flow, all of those sorts of things. So engineers say that they give accurate predictions over time from these models. Geologists will say, well, that's wishful thinking. Thanks for ruining my model. So they go... So just on the dynamic simulation, we, we can do two things with that dynamic simulation. We can run it backwards to history match production and injection history. So some fields like BP40s or Apache 40s these days have been on production since mid-70s. There's a huge production and injection history, which we can run the model backwards, match it. We think that's a well-calibrated model. Then when we run it forwards, 
we go back to the future, we can make predictions of production that we are likely to get with certain development scenarios. So we can play around with it. But the critical thing is we take a fine model, very, very fine Lego bricks, and we upscale it to be very coarse Lego bricks, or if you like, Duplo, if I want to be disparaging to simulation models. And at the same point, that means that engineers and geologists are using different models. They have a step that affects the way ideas and data translate between the two of them. They're effectively modeling their discipline and not modeling the subsurface as a single asset team, if you like. So I decided to ask engineers, why, why do you upscale? Like, why, why do you need to upscale? And I could divide their answers into corporate behavior, software issues, and technical issues. So the, the common one that you hear is that, well, simulations take too long. I can't simulate the fine scale model. It's going to take too long. It's going to give me convergent issues. Plus, the geologist just has too many realizations for me, for me to ever pick one and possibly simulate it. So it's just, it's just too complex. It's too big a job. To me, those are fundamentally software issues. That means we haven't given you software that's powerful enough for engineers to simulate the fine, real, the fine intricacies of the geology. There are other, other reasons why people upscale. Some of them are technical. The reservoir behaves like a tank. I don't need the complexity. So why would I simulate 5 million cells when 200,000 will do? And you see that for chalk reservoirs, you see that for aeolianites. So things like the Sherwood Sandstone Group, that's very local to here, can often behave like a tank if you don't have granulation seams, you don't have all sorts of geological structures in there. Um, but one that really boils my blood is when people say, well, of course we upscale, it's part of our corporate process. It's because the corporate process of that company was set up where there was a discipline that made the geological model and then there was a discipline that made the engineering model and the seam between them, the, the, the barrier to asset team integration was the upscaling process. Okay, so I'm bothered about software, so this is the thing that really concerns me and what can we do about this? So it turns out that different disciplines have a different focus. So here I've plotted on the x-axis stoic, which is stock tank oil initially in place. And geologists are very often interested in how much oil is there in the ground. And I've plotted it against the connected pore volume. That is how much volume of the reservoir is connected to enable flow. And geologists tend to care about the bit on the x-axis because they're asking questions. How much reserves is there? How much resource is there? What's my P50? What's my P90? What's my P10? In terms of how much money am I going to make? Whereas reservoir engineers tend to ask questions about producibility, how much is connected, how many wells will it take, can I push water through it, should I inject foam. So the very focus of the different models is very different, but it doesn't mean that there's not a need for that geological intricacy. So then I got to thinking about uncertainty, because a lot of my stuff that I do with clients is about quantifying uncertainty, which is of course is a misnomer, you can't quantify something that's uncertain, to, uncertain all you can do is you can run lots and lots of different models with all the possibilities you can think about and see what the spread of uncertainty is. And this, this graph shows two bars, one at sanction. So sanction is when you commission a project, a physical project. So I'm going to commission this oil field. What do I think the uncertainty is at the time I commission the oil field versus what, what is the uncertainty like now once I've been producing for a little bit? It turns out the geological description is not too bad in terms of, I mean, it's a high uncertainty, but we tend to get the uncertainty roughly right. The volume, we tend to get wrong. We tend to reduce the uncertainty as we go forward, so that's okay. That's what you'd expect the more wells that you drill. But the thing that's a real surprise is that the uncertainty for fluid mobility goes up as we begin to develop the field. And the producer performance prediction in terms of uncertainty and the injection prediction goes up as well. So it's an interesting situation that the more we develop, it seems the more in the dynamic simulation after sanction, we don't know. So uncertainty is going up. So I thought I'd ask engineers again, because I'm, I'm a geologist that doesn't mind talking to engineers. I guess that's partially why I'm here today, right? So I asked them, why, why, what prevents you running more uncertainty runs, testing more models? Again, I heard the same thing. 
The simulator takes too long. I haven't got time to analyze the results. The geologist can't make his mind up. We've got great 4D seismic. You know, it's not in our business process is another one that I'd hear. And so, you know, I begin to be concerned about this because there are some software issues there as well. So I thought, okay, we've got behavioral issues, we've got technical issues, but we've also got software issues. So, what if I could build you a stupendous super simulator of infinite scalability and complexity, where cell counts became no issue and simulator runtime was not a problem? Would it mean that you would still upscale? Would you actually have the ultimate answer to heterogeneity, production forecasting, history matching, and everything? Would you ask that simulator any smarter a question if you could be infinitely scalable? And so I kind of pondered this a little bit, and I asked some engineers about it, and the engineers were, you know, came into two, two camps. One said, oh, yeah, of course, I'd like more cells. Can you give me a reduction on my software licenses? Which was, made me feel uncomfortable. And then other people said, well, no, I don't need it, or I don't think it would give me anything different, or I haven't got time to use it. So I began to have a look at it. So we actually produced one of these things, one of these super simulators, if you like, one of these new simulators made on brand new infrastructure for modern computing. Lots of people use simulators that were based on Unix or Linux and were built through the 80s, through the 90s, and they're brilliant simulators up to a certain amount of scalability. This new simulator is built on modern high performance clusters. And so it's designed for modern computing infrastructure. If you keep adding cores to it and you keep adding software licenses to it, it, it should be infinitely scalable. As in, the more you get, the more that uh, you should be able to do with it. Doesn't mean you're going to ask it any smarter questions. Um, it per partitions the reservoir based on flow units, not based on cookie cutters. Some of the uh, original simulators, if you say, I've got eight cores, can I have that model divided eight ways? It will go, it will chop it eight times as if it's using a cookie cutter. Uh, it's got faster solvers. It doesn't care what type of grid it is. It can handle as many cells as you want to give it. Thousands of wells. But I guess really the, the interesting thing for a lot of us is that you can run it on the cloud. So you don't need to have the big workstation under your desk or the supercomputer in your office or down the hall or whatever. You can actually just connect to a data center that has the computing on the cloud. As long as, of course, you're willing to uh, pay the very limited fee for a subscription service to that particular set of cloud computing. So we've got an infinitely scalable simulator, but does it actually matter? So I'm going to show a piston example, and this is going to be a, a simple piece of rock, a one cell piece of rock, which I'm then going to divide into 10,000 individual cells. So I'm going to downscale it, and then I'm going to give it 10,000 random heterogeneities with a porosity range and a permeability range. I'm going to then push, quite simply, oil out of it by pushing water in the side, and I'm going to see what happens. So I've discretized a single cell. The outline of this square is the cell, in, and I've divided it into 10,000 cells, and I've given it a random porosity. I've also given it a random permeability, and then I run it through the simulator. And based on those heterogeneities, I begin to see water coming in from the, from the left-hand side, which is where I'm pushing it. And I begin to see this complex interfingering of water into oil. The actual color scale is saturation going from 0% uh, water to 100% water. You see this complex interfingering comes across. And that may be important if I'm trying to develop a complex oil field. And then, okay, for, right, that's interesting. I see this complex interfingering. Now I'll take these 10,000 heterogeneous grid blocks and make them homogeneous. So I gave them a set permeability of just over 1,000 millidarcies and a porosity of 22.5%. Did the same experiment again. Only this time, of course, I don't get the complex interfingering, but I do get the wave coming across as I begin to push water from left to right. Okay, cool. And then I thought, why not? Let's just upscale it back to one grid cell and see what happens with the same parameters. And at that resolution, of course, I just get material balance. I don't really see anything. I just gradually see the block change. So then if I plot the simulation results, 
and one of the things I'm really interested in when we're doing enhanced oil recovery and we're pushing water into the ground is I want to see when water's going to break through into the wells. Because I need to know when the water's going to come in because I need to have the separator on the platform ready to take the water out of the oil. And I see that I end up with vastly different results in terms of when that could possibly happen. So again, it depends what the question is. If my question is, do I care when water breakthrough comes, then perhaps using a simplistic upscaled model is not necessarily what I need. So then I had a look at what the actual technical challenges were on the projects that we're running around the globe, and this at the current state, not using the high resolution simulator. And I see that you know, there's quite a, a spread of what the issues are. Some of them are structural complexity, as in they can't get the faults to flow or seal or do whatever they think they should do. About a third of it is due to fluid mobility. Some of it's due to reservoir size or pressure, pressure um, maintenance. But I see that a lot of those issues there are issues that we could solve if we had, you know, if we, for specific questions, finer scale simulations. So here's just an example, just a quick video of, if it runs, of two models, a fine scale model and a coarse scale model. And I can see that I'm going to just strip it back, and this is a porosity model, and I can see the intricacies of the channels in the lower one. I can see the discretized intricacy, the lack of intricacy, if you like, in the upper scale one. And these are two real models that were run and test, the simulator was tested on. If I look at the water sweep between the two, I can see one's more discretized, one's less discretized. Just like having the difference between a 4K TV and a regular TV. It depends whether you actually care about the picture that you're seeing. But again, it has an impact on water flooding in these fields. And if I'd have used one development scenario over another development scenario, I may have a wrong size separator on the rig that could create me significant issues. Can't dump the water over the side, what do I do with it? Well, the only way to do it is to really shut down production. If I shut down production, I'm shutting down cash flow to the company, which is obviously a serious problem. Uh, we're also using high resolution simulators these days, not just for testing water flooding, but for doing things with uh, these grids to look at things like hydraulic fracturing. I refuse to use the word fracking because that now has negative connotations to it. And we're just talking about hydraulically stimulating a well, not necessarily uh, for the purposes of shale gas, but to just let's just say hydraulic stimulation of a well. I really care about the fine scale detail around the fractures but I might not care about the fine scale detail at the same resolution away from those fractures. So I want an adaptive grid where that grid is very fine along the, I was going to say along the fracts, along the fractures, and very coarse away from it. Because I want to characterize what's happening in the subsurface. So now we use these models with a inter intersect, which is our simulator coupled to something called mangrove, which is you know, quite handy for doing hydraulic fracturing simulation. I'm sure most people in the public would like us to have fully simulated what happens before we run a hydraulic fracturing job than just have a bash at it, right? So then I looked at where we'd applied our new simulator. And I'm going to give a couple of case studies, and I'm going to be cognizant of time so I don't run over because I have a lot of case studies. But I'm going to look at the first one, which is Troll, which is a, a Norwegian example of a gas field. And the reservoir simulation model had 1.6 million active cells, and it was crawling along using an upscaled grid. It covers about uh, 30 by 50 square kilometers, and at 150, 150 grid resolution, you know, it's, it's not that coarse, um, but it, you know, basically just couldn't run it before. So we had to upscale it and discretize it to be even more simpler in order to, uh, in order to run things. Coupled onto that, we also have a lot of structural complexity, a complicated fault network, which when we start using coarse Lego bricks, we can't get the fault structure quite correct, so we can't get fault communication correct. We have problems with different sides of the field talking to each other across faults. We also have a very complex production history, lots of multilateral wells, lots of long horizontal branches with multiple sections of completions. So we have a whole different complexity of well sections turning on and off, superimposed onto geological complexity at a level that using a lower order of complexity in the model, we can't really mimic effectively. 
Onto that, we also have a very thin oil column. The actual vertical expanse of oil is not very big. The easy oil has gone, you know. Um, and it's connected to a huge amount of aquifer support. So using 400,000 to 600,000 cells is really not going to cut the mustard when it comes to this level of complexity. So when you run the simulation using previous, um, previous simulators, upscale simulators, it was taking about 20 years of production history and about two days to run that. So really, if you were to run that, you would get one realization of that model. You could test one development scenario once every two days. So if you were trying to actually make a high capex decision, decision, you'd be running the simulators constantly and building the models constantly in order to get enough data in order to then make a decision of what's right, what's, what's correct in terms of the business for the field. So it makes things really difficult. So uh, I'm going to discuss two different simulators and about the smart partitioning that was used. So I said that Eclipse or a lot of legacy simulators use cookie cutter ways of dividing up the reservoir if we want to send it to multiple different cores of the computer. And the model at the bottom is what Eclipse would have done with it, as it would have come down, divided it into stripes, sent each one of those off to a core, simulated the stripes, put them back together, and then resolved any equations that were needed to make them all speak to each other. When it comes to Intersect, or one of the new simulators, what it does is it extracts flow units from the model. So it tests the model first to look at the flow units using, uh, you know, it could use a streamlined simulation or, 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 or another method, takes those flow units, divides them up, sends them off to individual cores, and then brings them back. So rather than take a single, so imagine if we have a river system, rather than taking a channel and divide that channel into however many bits it needs to and sends it off, to all these different parts of the simulator and brings it back together. Intersect would just take the entire channel, send it off to one core, and then take another channel, send it off to another core, and do it in terms of flow units. So it's smart partitioning. But then we found with runtimes, as long as we kept adding cores to it, and we kept adding licenses to it, the runtimes went down exponentially, enabling us to run it a lot quicker. So we got a lot more simulations, a lot more tests of different development scenarios, a lot more uncertainty runs, so we could make a more informed decision when it comes to a large capital expenditure on the field. So that was with Troll. And talk about a second one, a large discovery in the North Sea. If you recognise the geometry of it, you'll know where it is. If you don't, then it has to remain, remain, uh, remain without name. So... This didn't have any history associated with it. So we weren't running the model backwards to get a history match. We were talking about a concept selection to develop the field. How do we develop this, this new large discovery in, in this sector of the North Sea? You know, we could do it in a whole bunch of different ways using different well techniques, different stimulation techniques, different sets of completions, you know, different ways of accessing the reservoir. Do we need you know, long horizontals? Do we need multilaterals? Can we... Can we splay off a you know, single well? Do we need side tracks? A whole bunch of different questions to test. So we need to test different concepts. So again, we've got a, a grid 200 meters by 200 meters by 1.4 meters vertically. So it's not that coarse a model. It's about 2 million cells in total and about a quarter of a million active cells. Active cells are cells that will flow, whereas there will be cells that will be in shales that won't flow, that are, you know, to all intents and purposes, relatively useless, they're non-net in terms of what we would consider it in the oil industry. So development scenario with 84 wells, these are the initial, um, these are the initial uh, reservoir conditions. In terms of pressure maintenance, so not many reservoirs flow under virgin pressure these days. If you stick a pin in the ground, a hole in the ground, it doesn't spew oil out and everyone yells Eureka and then runs to the bank. That doesn't really happen anymore. So we have to force pressure into the reservoir to maintain pressure to force oil out the other side. So we could do that just injecting water, or we could do it by injecting the polymer, and these were the development scenarios we wanted to test for this particular field. So we tried it in various ways. We tried using local grid refinements, so just refining the bits that matter around the wells. We tested all sorts of different ways of doing it with local grid refinement, but it just wouldn't work. The fine scale model was exceptionally slow, and the runtime to test these different development scenarios was over a week. So that's one answer to one development concept in one week. 
So I would imagine most people would want to test a whole suite and test them again using slightly different parameters. So if we think of 48 simulations a year, assuming that the reservoir engineer was going to take four weeks off for rest and relaxation, 48 simulations might not be enough to actually characterize the potential issues that could happen with a particular development concept. So we applied our new reservoir to it and gave them um, you know, the cores that they required and got the run times down to, um, that should be below a week, for the desired resolution. Um, we could keep running it and we could keep running it and connect it up via the cloud to high performance clusters and make it as scalable as necessary so we could run enough simulations as, as required. And in the end, you know, we got it down to a level where you could begin to test uncertainties with these things and really come up with some meaningful development decisions rather than just we simulated it a handful of times and we got these set of results. So the critical decision of whether to go with a polymer or whether to go with water for pressure maintenance could be made you know, using evidence as opposed to just gut feeling. I'll just talk about one more maybe. We also had a, a sour gas supergiant oil field. Now sour gas hydrogen sulfide is a very bad thing. As in, if you get any indication of sour gas on a rig, um, lots of alarms go off, lots of magenta alarms, for those of you that just watched the Deepwater Horizon movie. Sour gas is bad. So you want to simulate exactly what's going to happen. You want to know how much sour gas you're going to produce, and you want to design the facilities on the rig to the extent that they can handle the amount of sour gas that you're going to produce. So this was a huge reservoir of naturally fractured carbonate, it was 3.7 million cells, and we did a compositional simulation. That means that we have changes in the composition of the oil phase or the liquids phase and the gas phases as we produce them with 116 miles in this case. But the critical thing was there were 12,000 fractures that were discretized throughout the model. And a fracture is a planar structure. Around the planar structure, we want to know exactly what's happening, maybe not care as much away from the fractures. But we need to make sure these fractures are precisely put into the models. So we produced a model, and it wasn't possible to run with the conventional simulator, as in it just wouldn't run. But off the basis of you know, making it scalable and uh, adding as much software as we could throw it and as many cores as we could throw it, we could now run it so a field development plan could be implemented based on the forecasts from the simulation. So before they were kind of guessing roughly what they would get, Maybe not guessing is perhaps a little mean. You know, these are experienced petrotechnical professionals. They kind of know what they think is going to happen based on experience and based on the data that they have. But once you've got simulations and you've got sufficient simulations to show a reasonable quantification of uncertainty for the scenarios you've tested, then really you've got something to hang your hat on. So we also have all sorts of different case studies which I could run through, but I'm going to skip through them to really talk about the fact that when it comes to simulation, um, simulation is a lot more than just coming up with the correct amount of scenarios that you need. It's really helping the asset team that we have in an oil field to work well together. So the problems that I find in assets are software related, as I, as I mentioned with the questions we had before. They're technical related, and they're also related in terms of collaboration. And a typical asset team will consist of a petrophysicist, a couple of geophysicists, a couple of geologists, a couple of reservoir engineers, and an asset manager. And they'll all be sat in their little offices working on their particular little package. And they'll do their exceptionally uh, meticulous technical work. And then they will take it and they will pass it to the next person along the workflow. And at that point, if they're not using a single software, they have to export everything, take it round next door, import everything into the new software, and have a conversation with that person in order to inform them what they've done, what they've considered, and uh, you know all the details pertaining to the study that they've performed. So we're all engineers or geologists or petrotechnical experts here or fluid flow people or you know whatever. We're all technical people 
how well do conversations work when you go and talk to your colleagues about really complicated concepts? How good is the communication in your building? If you have to leave the confines of your office, how easy is it for communication to flow? Well, it turns out that uh, that's actually a real barrier for passing ideas down the line, particularly when people are very busy, particularly when they're very cost sensitive and the oil price is low and people are competing for their fiefdoms when it, there's potentially redundancies in the mix. So people don't necessarily talk as well as they should. And also people model their disciplines. The petrophysicist does modeling for their particular need. The geologist does, geologist does modeling for his particular need. And the reservoir engineer does it for their particular need. So I call that method of working over the hedge development as in, you do your little bit of work, and then you toss the model that you've just developed over the hedge for the next person down the line to deal with it. But to be honest, all geologists and reservoir engineers and the asset managers and the economists and you know, everyone in that particular asset team all have the same business aim. They want to produce as much as possible in an efficient and safe manner in order to get cash flow into the business so everyone gets paid, everyone's mortgage gets paid. So the business aim is actually a uniting thing. And the why question of why are you doing that study should be exactly the same thing. So really, why shouldn't the different units use a single earth model? Why would the engineers use one model and the geologists use one model? So my point that I make to companies is, why do you actually, you're modeling the subsurface, you're not modeling the discipline. Why are you doing it in three or four different applications? There's no real need to do that. So if you actually remove that seam, that stage gate that is upscaling from the engineers and the geologists, and they all work on a single model together, the flow of knowledge and ideas and concepts flows all the way through the asset, and they come up with maybe not a unique solution, but they tend to come up with something that's more consistent internally. Geologists and engineers have different focuses, and they, have, they bring different things to the table. And just like in any particular team, you want a diversity of nationalities and genders and you know, perspectives, bringing that all into one place as well with, a, with a, a, you know, an oil-filled asset really sort of advances things for us. So I'm an advocate of high-resolution simulation from a technical perspective, but also from a human-to-human -human perspective because things work better when engineers talk to each other. So, but I have a couple of rules. First thing is, in order to use a high resolution simulator, you need to be clear of the question that you're using in the first place. What is the business question you're trying to answer? The first thing that I do whenever I go on a consultancy job at a company is I ask, what are you building the model for? And I would expect that if I say, what are you building the model for? Why, what is your modus operandi? Why do you exist? That an answer would come instantly. Very often I get, well, we're building it to identify well targets and we're building it to test um, you know, production in the future and to history match, we're having a bit of problems with that and we're having a bit of problems with this. And They build models for all sorts of different purposes and they expect a single model to answer all of those things. I'm a believer that a geological model or an engineering model is a scientific hypothesis you build it for one question, just like you build a scientific experiment for one question, and you, you build that model in a specific way to answer that question. You don't build a single model to answer all of the questions necessary. You build it for hypothesis testing, or you build it for reducing uncertainty in some aspect. So there's some interesting comments that came out of a, uh, a, a conference I was part of in 2014, which was recognizing the limits of reservoir modeling. And some of these comments have stuck with me because I think they're actually uh, philosophically quite apt. That sophistication is not the same as clever. As in, I could give you the most complicated simulator in the world. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to apply it to you know, a, clever, a clever business question or a clever science question. Clever can mean simple. And very often, to answer a question, you don't need a geological model. Some of the best questions in the North Sea have been, asked, have been answered with light tables and maps before software was around. So you don't actually need to be as sophisticated as possible for certain questions. Modeling now seems to be a thing that people do by habit. 
if I go into a company and I say, okay, what do you want to do? They go, we need, we need a model. Okay, why do you need a model? People now model out of habit. It seems to be the thing that you do. You know, just like everyone, you know, kids with the iPhones, got to have them. They've all got to have carpal tunnel syndrome by the time they're 20. They've all got to have them, just like modeling software. Everyone seems to have them now. The sort of considered design of the, of the business and the considered design of the scientific question are kind of not done to the same rigor that they would do in the past. You know, and we see this very often. It's just like the dissolution of people's spatial awareness as a reaction to GPSs being on the market. You know, if I said to somebody, which direction's Derby from here, I would probably guess that most people in the older generations would know which direction it is. Most people that were probably below a certain generation would think for a second before giving an answer if they knew the answer. So consider the design, make your models tailored to the decisions that you require. But the second, the second thing is have a need for the added resolution. And it all depends what the question is. And the most simple way of explaining this to an undergraduate is, for years we had x-rays, and x-rays rays were really good. If the question is, is your skull broken, an x-ray is perfectly fine for answering that question. But if I want to know, do you have internal bleeding to your cerebral cortex, that's a different science question which requires an added level of resolution. So you need to actually have a reason for the resolution in there in the first place. So I guess really, to conclude, some of my main thoughts are, now you can have infinitely complicated simulators, but do you actually need them? Upscaling is a thing that's legacy, that's imposed by the software. It's not a necessity anymore, it's not required. You can all work on a single model if you need to, if you need that level of resolution. So you can have more simulations, more analyses, better uncertainty quantification, better, not sure about my wording there, more uncertainty quantification. More is not the same as better, just as precision is not the same as accuracy. You always need to be cognizant what your business, business requirement is, what your business question is before you embark upon a simulation. And that's one thing that often gets forgotten. What is the modus operandi? That should be you know, at the forefront of your mind every single day you go to work. It should be on a post-it note stuck on your monitor. It should be tattooed on your forearm. You know, it should be a constant reminder. If ever I go and ask why are you building a model and people don't know, it really worries me. But not all fields require that additional level of resolution. If, you use, if you've got a reservoir tank, Sherwood Sandstone Group, Cretaceous Chalk, high connectivity, few wells, you know, simple black oil model, you don't really require the additional level of resolution, so why would you go to the effort of building a more complicated model? Um, single aim, business aim should, requ should require a single reservoir concept, as in if you think it's one grossly different scenario to the engineer, you've got a problem, perhaps you should have a discussion. Um, software tools do not replace careful, scientific, complementative thought, you should always think about what you're doing rather than just doing it. I see a lot of geological models that are a lot, that are a lot of rubbish generated very quickly. I see a lot of uncertainty analyses that are a spectrum of rubbish generated very quickly. You, know, you should always be careful about what you're doing. Model is not there to answer every single question. It should be apt to answer a handful of questions that goes into the model design in the first place. Model the reservoirs, not the discipline. But my core message in asset teams is that engineers and geologists, you know, you're kind of working for the same thing here. You're both there for the success of the business. Be good to one another, right? So really, I think that there's one subsurface. There's normally one asset, and so there should be one model. And I just ripped off uh, this from the license analyzer this morning to see what Gurk had access to. And... This is more simulation power than any oil company that I currently work with because you obviously get the licenses as an academic donation and you're responsible for your own high performance computing cluster. So you have 20 of the core simulator and you have 20 of the core simulator but you also have 20 doublers. So the way it works is you have one simulator and you have a doubler that doubles the power of that simulator so you could put a doubler on it and then a doubler doubler. And then if you want to work that out in Excel, you can see how many cores you possibly have access to. 
Um, but that's that's all I got. So I'm happy to take any questions.